Hi, this presentation is going to go over correlations. And a correlation is used to examine a relationship between two variables. And the data are represented as xy pairs with x as the independent and y as the dependent variable. And we can view this graphically by examining a scatter plot. The relationship between two variables can range from positive to negative and from linear to nonlinear to no correlation at all. And these graphs all represent images of those uh, possibilities. So a correlation tells us about the strength and direction of the way two variables are related to each other. And correlation coefficient is represented by the letter R and is found through this equation. And you can see in the numerator we have sample times the sum of the xy product minus the individual sum of x times the individual sum of y. Down here in the denominator we've got uh, the square root of n times the sum of x squared minus uh, the sum of x squared times the square root of the sum of y squared minus the sum of y squared. Uh, in the first case times the sample size. So the range goes from negative 1, which is a perfect negative relationship, all the way up to a positive 1, which is a perfect positive relationship. And a 0 would represent no relationship at all. So as we get close to those limits of 1 and negative 1, the strength is said to increase. So a, a negative 0.91 correlation is a very strong negative correlation as it gets close to minus 1. Similarly, a 0.8 correlation, because it's getting close to 1, is a very strong positive correlation. Uh, in between, we find some moderate uh, values. 0.42 is a moderate relationship. Uh, some might call it weak, because it's less than 0.5. Uh, the nonlinear correlation we see here with a 0.07, uh, this is really not related at all. It's very close to 0. So to find our correlation coefficient, we need to first find the sum of x values, then the sum of y values. We multiply the x and y, and we find the sum of the xy product. Next, we find the square of each x value, and we sum that up. And then we do the same for the y's. And with those values, we can plug them into this equation that we discussed previously, and from that we get our R correlation. Here's an example of some data where we calculate a correlation coefficient R. Uh, here in this column we have our X values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Over here we have our Y values, minus 3, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. And so we have the sum of those. Then we have the product uh, over here in this column. And then we have the sum of the product. Over here we have the square of x. Over here we have the square of y. And down here we have the sum of the squared x and the sum of the squared y. So with those values in this uh, bottom uh, row, we can plug them into our equation. And in this case, uh, we would find 0.986, a very strong positive linear correlation. So here's a correlation where we're going to be looking at the relationship between the number of hours uh, 12 students watch television and the scores of their tests on the following Monday. And so uh, here's the hours in this row, and here's the test scores in this row. And we're going to display the scatter plot, and we're going to calculate our correlation coefficient. So the scatter plot will just show the pairs of data points between x and y. And there we can kind of see what looks like a negative, uh, but perhaps a moderate negative relationship taking shape there. To calculate our correlation coefficient, we need to uh, get our sum of x, our sum of y, our sum of xy product, our sum of x squared, and our sum of y squared. And so down here we have those values. We plug them into our equation. And it, in fact, we actually have a negative, uh, fairly strong relationship, uh, negative 0.831. So beyond calculating a correlation coefficient for a sample,
we often want to know whether or not we can generalize that correlation to the population. And here we're making a, a, a discussion of statistical significance. And uh, if we're talking about a population coefficient, uh, we're looking at the Greek letter rho, which I know looks like a P, but uh, the Greek letter rho is going to represent the population correlation coefficient. And so we're going to want to know if our sample R is a good estimate of our population rho. And so one way to determine that is uh, we've got to find our uh, cutoff values at alpha levels, 0.05 or 0.01 in this case. And uh, for a sample of 6, rho is significant at the 5% significance level. And these are the steps involved with testing a population correlation coefficient. First, we determine the number of pairs of data in the sample, our xy pairs. That will give us n. We then specify our alpha level. From that, we get our critical value using our table. Then we decide if the correlation is significant. And if r is greater than the critical value, the correlation is significant. And then we finally interpret the decision in the context of the original claim. So returning to our earlier uh, example of uh, watching television and test scores, uh, we already de determined the correlation coefficient in the sample is negative 0.831. Now we want to know, uh, does that exist in the population? Can we generalize that at the alpha 0.01 level? And from our table for 12 data pairs, uh, which we have here, at a 0.01 level, we see that the cutoff is 0.708. And uh, because 831 is larger, it is statistically significant. And there is enough evidence at the 1% level, therefore, to conclude there is a significant linear relationship between hours of television watching and test scores on Monday. We can also use a hypothesis test for rho. And here we see that the null is that rho will be greater than or equal to 0. Uh, and then that the alternative row is less than zero, which is significant negative correlation. That's a left-tailed test. For right-tailed test, uh, row is less than or equal to zero. The alternative row is greater than zero. And for a two-tailed test, row equals zero for the null, and the alternative row does not equal zero. And we can use a t-test for the correlation coefficient. Recall that is adjusted by degrees of freedom. And it's uh, minus 1 for each variable. We have two variables, so it's minus 2 degrees of freedom uh, from the sample. And we've got 12 uh, in the sample, so that will give us 10 degrees of freedom. Uh, so our test statistic, t, is found by taking r over uh, the standard deviation there. So we have r over the square root of 1 minus r squared divided by n minus 2. And these are the steps for constructing our hypothesis test. First, we have to state our null and our alternative hypothesis, specifying direction. And uh, we specify our level of significance, our alpha, our degrees of freedom of n minus 2. We determine the critical value and rejection region from our table. Next, we find our test statistic using the equation shown before. And then we make our decision to either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And from that, we can interpret our decision in the context of the original claim. So we'll go back to our example of uh, television viewing and test scores, and we will set this up as hypothesis test. So here uh, we're looking at a two-tailed test where the null hypothesis is no correlation, and the alternative is a significant correlation. The significant level is 0.01 as before. Degrees of freedom is 10, which is our sample of 12 minus 2 degrees of freedom for each variable in the analysis. The critical values from the t table, uh, based on those uh, specifications, are minus 3.169 and plus 3.169. And the standardized test statistic is calculated uh, with these numbers. And from that, we get negative 4.72, which falls outside of the cutoff zone, meaning it is statistically significant. There is enough evidence to conclude a significant linear correlation between TV and test scores. One final thought as we close our discussion of correlations is to mention that correlation does not necessarily imply causation. 
Uh, two things can be related without being causally linked. And here are the reasons. One is that uh, sometimes there's a reverse cause and effect relationship. Uh, sometimes there's an indirect cause and effect relationship. Sometimes there are third variables that uh, may explain both of the variables. We would call that spuriousness. It's possible that the relationship is just purely coincidental as well. So we need to be careful uh, when we examine correlations that we interpret them appropriately, not necessarily as causally related. We've got to consider the order of time. Does the cause come before the effect? We've got to consider the possibility of spuriousness. And we've got to also consider the possibility of coincidence and chance.